Hello, NFT land. I am Creatorius Rex. I'm really excited to be here with an artist spotlight this week. And joining me for the interview is going to be The Apparition, also known as Skojo, Josh Scott. Hello. Sorry for my green screen being crazy today. Hey, that's, that's all great. It, you know what? I kind of like it. If you flicker a little bit, it draws the eye. You're going to be the center of attention. That's what you always wanted. Yes. All right. So I'm really excited to bring onto the stage Matthew Curry. Matthew, welcome. Thanks, guys. How's it going? Good. Good to see you again. Likewise. Hello, everyone out there. Yeah, absolutely. So, so Matthew is quite an acclaimed illustrator, graphic designer, uh, Grammy nominations, I noticed from his uh, past work. Really, really a, a great sense of what culture is. And, and and we're just really honored that we got to work with Matthew so much during the Niftorian project so far. We thought it'd be great to spotlight you and really talk a little bit about your career and how you got to where you are and what brings you to where you are today with your art. And, you know, one of the things that, you know, I saw a video that was done of you and you talked about this idea of you find inspiration everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me about that. And then we'll go, well, let's, let's start with that. And then let's, then we'll do your backstory after that. It's like how you, sure. how you came up from, from the hard scrabble beginnings to become a famous artist that you are today. Um, well, it, it, when I was speaking in particular in that, in that uh, profile where, you know, I was saying inspiration was everywhere, you know, I don't think that's an uncommon thing for, for creatives and artists uh, to, to, to find. Um, and I was speaking, I was speaking kind of specifically to, um, y you know, the, the idea that because of my career, I, I kind of dipped my toe a little bit in like illustration and graphic design, and then there's fine art and things like that. And, and, you know, those, all those elements are around us at, all the time, whether I'm watching cartoons with my kid, you know, I, I'm, I'm hugely inspired by the creative work that gets put out in the world from the most kind of, you know, uh, avant-garde to even the most um, banal, right? So, I mean, I find inspiration uh, in, in packaging design. If I'm, if I'm putting groceries away, you know, and uh, I'll see something as mundane as, as how they've laid out the type on the side of a package and that arrangement of information and, and how it kind of creates this killer piece of, of visual, uh, you know, reference. And, you know, for me, all that stuff is important, not only from an inspiration standpoint, but it's also, it's fodder for, you know, being better at your craft. So I, I do my best to kind of take those inspirational cues, almost, you know, file them in the, in the memory bank, so to speak, so that I can kind of have those moments where I've noticed something that maybe I'd never noticed before. Um, and so when it comes to, you know, some people are, you know, they hate seeing advertising everywhere. They hate seeing, um, you know, the bombardment of branding and, 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 you know, advertising, marketing materials, those kinds of things. And I get that. Um, but, you know, I've always looked at that stuff uh, from, from an admiration of the craft. So if a commercial is really good, I think we can all agree, right? You see a commercial, right? You know, whether it's at the Super Bowl or something, and you're like, wow, that was a great commercial. That was a great ad or you know, but if you were to tell people, oh, yeah, I really find commercials inspiring, they would probably think you're a little <laughs> weird. Um, but, you, you know, it's important to know, I, I guess it's maybe it comes from having worked on so many different kinds of projects and collaborated with so many different kinds of people, marketing, advertising, art directors, fellow designers, fellow artists, illustrators, et cetera, musicians, chefs, um, you know, 
to me, it, it, it's, I guess I, I'm more inspired by the fact that there, there's so much availability for people to express themselves <clears throat> and to make a, a living out of that. You know, I, I think that's great, especially for a kid growing up who, you know, I didn't grow up, I didn't have any relatives who were involved in the creative industry. Um, so to me, it was always this very, you know, vague, a uh, wide open kind of thing. And I really right. didn't know how to get my head around it uh, growing up because I wasn't exposed to people who were say, maybe they were a photographer or a designer. And, and then, um, you know, once I became more educated in the exposure side of being exposed to people doing this as a living and, and making it uh, in the world, you know, that to me has always been an inspiration. So I can see it, an ad campaign. I can see branding. Right. I can see a poster design, you know, and I can see the art that went into it. The person who worked on that, the multiple people, you know, whether or not it came out successful, well, that's one thing. But, you know, I, I tend to look for the good in, in all that stuff. And um, so that's that's always been the way I roll, you know, I mean, so I can get inspired by just about everything. Well, we're, we're in Super Bowl season. And so mm -hmm. we just saw a lot of new ads and they're, right. and they're clearly worse. There's at least one, I think there are a couple ads that were inspiring uh, that because they're basically short films. There's one that mm -hmm. comes to mind immediately, which I think was the best, the best commercial shown at the Super Bowl in 2022. And that was about a, uh, two brothers who were skiers. One lost his eyesight when he was very young. They were, you know, really accomplished uh, cross country skiers. And then they went on to, I think they won something like double digits Olympic medals in biathlon. And because he's, uh, because he's uh, blind or mostly blind, legally blind, at least um, I think his brother, his brother competed with him. And so they were like a team. And that was amazing, right? And and that's the type of thing that we want to see. And that's not the only thing. Obviously, we see these from time to time. I could also think of like some Molson Canadian commercials that I think are amazing. Uh, so those are inspiring, particularly if you're Canadian. Uh, so so I see that. I, I and I I think that. Uh, I guess it goes back to Oliver Wendell Holmes. We we all know, we all know when. Uh, advertising is more than just an ad when it's inspiring and, uh, yeah. and anything can be. Yeah. So, yeah, absolutely. So like, I have a question though, for you, just like to follow up on that and then we'll get to your backstory. Uh, you said you like see things like, you know, I kind of get this picture of Neo in the matrix, you know, seeing mm -hmm. all the, all the digits or something like that. And I, I know that's true of people when you become an expert in something, you just see things other people don't. You could be a professional golfer and see someone's golf swing. This is like you see things that other people don't see. Right. Um, you could be a, a CFO and look at a spreadsheet and immediately just like zero in on the cell that matters. Uh, how much of that is nature and how much is that nurture? How much do you think is instinctual just based on your background? How much was your training? You know, I would say it's 50-50 in that I think that, that it was always there, but it, it, it was it was time that you you kind of learn to almost harness it, right? Through experience, you're able to put your own um, ex experience and, and kind of map it onto what you see. So, I, I mean, for, you know, for example, it, if, if I'm walking through, say, the shopping mall and, you know, as you're walking through the mall and, and you're passing, you know, an ad campaign that you'll probably see, maybe it's one poster, then it's a second poster, a third poster on like a kiosk type right, stand yep. or something like that. And maybe it's for like, you know, the jewelry store or, or Nordstrom's is releasing a line or something to that effect. And you know, for, for the people who have been involved in that process, you know, I think you can see right through it. You can almost picture in Skojo, you, you probably know what I'm talking about, where, you know, you can almost imagine the pitch meeting. You can imagine how the core concept, maybe it started a little bit more creatively. And then over time, it got whittled down into this, whatever is out there, you know, and sometimes 
that whipping down did more harm than good. Um, but you again, you can kind of you can see the moves, you can see the X's and O's. And when you're talking about kind of seeing it through the matrix, you know, it is a little bit like that. And, and, you know, it's, it's part, it's equal parts frustrating and equal parts, you know, helpful. Um, you wish you could kind of like turn it off and just enjoy something, right? Like more straight up without having to see always, you know, looking for the wizard behind the curtain on, on a, a number of projects that, that I'll come across. Um, but, you know, in the long run, it becomes helpful. And, and I think that that just happens over time. I think like when I first started getting, uh, for example, when I first got to art school, I was naive in, in, you know, the broadest sense of the word in terms of like, you know, what career in the creative arts, whether it was a graphic art, photography, industrial design, architecture, fine art, et cetera, you know, I did not know what it took. And it wasn't, you know, until, you know, having worked on a number of different kinds of projects with, uh, you know, a number of different kinds of teams uh, to collaborate with, you know, you just kind of, you kind of learn to, you, you learn your craft, you get better at it. Um, you know, there's a lot of people you know, when you're a young designer, you can be super talented and have an amazing eye and, you know, really be a fantastic designer. But, you know, you, you might not be very good at working with a group of people. You're, maybe you're, you're not able to take critiques very well, or maybe you're not able to put yourself, you know, in the broader spectrum of, of what the market and the end user ultimately is really going to appreciate and being willing to kind of step back from that and go, okay, well, I'm not making a Mona Lisa here. I'm here to do a job and to get this, this piece of whatever it is, this, this material out in the world so that in a design situation, you know, so that it accomplishes all the goals that your the, the client wants. Um, and if you can put something out there in the world that fits all that criteria, and then on top of it is something brilliant or beautiful, you know, that's a bonus. But those situations are few and far between, right? Even an artist is uh, going to have to make some considerations. And, you know, I, I can only speak for myself and for me the interest was always the process and learning something so like when i worked with you guys that was a new thing for me right and that's what excited me the most about it and um that's what excited me throughout my entire career was okay i'm i'm gonna work as an art director at this agency and work on these big uh campaigns and then you know in the off hours i'm gonna be you know, doing fine art and galleries and, and other kinds of things like that. And, um, you know, at it, to me, it, it all comes down to that variety is what makes, in my opinion, me personally, my work stronger. And it makes me garner a greater satisfaction from it. Mm -hmm. Because when when you put yourself in that in that role of accomplishing a goal you're 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 giving yourself a point a and a point b to get to and if you're always just making art for yourself well the finish line is never there you know it's always going further and further and you know you can spin your wheels and again this is only speaking for myself in that i could be very interested in this painting style that I'm doing six months ago, right? But then maybe a couple months go by and I realize, oh, I'm not interested in that at all. And I'm not getting anything out of that. And I can right. recognize when to stop something. And I think that only comes from experience. And, you know, again, speaking for myself, you know, the creative mind is not the most suitable for that you know, production meeting at 9 a.m. every day or meeting with a bunch of different kinds of folk 
who all have different jobs to do on the same project. Um, sorry to go off on a tangent there, but you know, it's, it's, to me that, that is important. Is, and, and that's where I am in my career is that I do things that interest me and in the process and the body of work as a whole is kind of like the end game for me, if that makes any sense, rather than like, Oh yeah, I know him, his work, it looks like this and you see it, you know, right. it's that same thing that you see over and over again. Um, I, I've never been that kind of artist. I've always been the person who's like, okay, what's next? Let's go. Very cool. Very hey, cool. Matt, can you do this style? We were kind of thinking about something along these lines and stuff. I'm like, oh, you know what? That'd be really interesting. You know what we could do? So, well, let, let's walk through uh, your career. We can start if you want in school or after school. It's really your choice. Sure. But why don't we walk through based on, I don't know, styles or learnings? Why don't we do it that way? Why don't we say, like, how did you get here and what were the inner immediate steps. Sure. Well, I can tell you, you know, as a little kid, I won't spend a lot of time on this, but you know, I, at some point in my early days, um, I had an affinity for drawing. I got really into cartooning and, um, illustration. I didn't know it was illustration, right? I was just a little kid drawing cartoons. I was into comic books. Um, I was into when we would go to the beach and I would see guys airbrushing, uh -huh. You know, on the boardwalk, I was like, whoa, you know, that's incredible. And going back to that kind of naivete that I had, you know, for me, I was like, I don't know, maybe I'll get a job uh, at Disney being an animator or, you know, even though I knew nothing about that stuff. But so I was always really into um, cartooning and drawing uh, in high school. Um, I, I, I when I was about 14 and freshman year or 15, uh, I joined the school newspaper or I was asked to join the school newspaper and I became their graphic artist and I would cartoon and make little spot illustrations for the articles. But I also started doing, my mother got me a book on uh, from a political cartoonist and I forget which one it was. I think it was an Oliphant book. Uh -huh. And anyway, I was just really mesmerized with, you know, trying to figure out this style that all these political cartoonists seem to do more or less the same kind of style, this pen and ink. You know, I had gotten some rapidiographs. I didn't really know how to use them. I had some Bristol board. And so I started doing political cartoons just for myself. And then the school editor was like, oh, you should start doing political cartoons for 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 us. And so I started doing that um, and I won a, a national award for that. And that was the reason why I bring it up is because that's when my parents finally were like, oh, OK, all right. You know, some recognition for this kind of stuff. Cool. All right. We can see that. So, you know, that kind of had me start thinking about like going to art school. So flat, uh, I got into uh, art school. Um, and again, I, I, when we had to pick our majors, you know, I, I was like, well, illustration, of course. And um, while I was at art school, you know, obviously I learned a lot. And, and a lot of it was just from the, the, the other students, right? And was meeting all these kids from all over the world who were incredibly talented. It was a very intimidating kind of situation. Um, you know, I, I, I honestly, I learned, I think I learned more from my, uh, my colleagues or, you know, my fellow students than I did probably in the classrooms and in the studios. You know, I definitely learned some techniques and things like that. Um, and a little bit about materials and, you know, kind of the, the rudimentary stuff. So uh, ha after art school, um, you know, we moved, uh, my now wife, she was at Brown University at the time, so we were close by. Uh, we moved down to uh, Orlando, Florida for like a six month kind of hiatus, right? So we moved down there. Her brother was working down there uh, for a hotel. He was in hotel, uh, the hotel industry, hotel business. That's what he went to school for. He was like, why don't you guys come down here 
you know, spend six months, you know, get your act together and then, you know, figure out what, where you guys want to go. My parents were real cool about it, which I was surprised. Um, they, they obviously trust and care for, you know, Eugenia. And, um, and so we moved down there and her brother was like, so what are you going to do for a living? And I was like, I don't know. And he said, Hey, there's this restaurant up the street called cafe Tutu tango. And I was like, Oh, okay, cool. And he's like, yeah, they serve nothing but appetizers. And their tagline is where the starving artist comes to eat. And I was like, okay, all right, fair enough. Cool. And he's like, let's go there tonight. So we went there for dinner and you know, it's a, uh, I don't even know if it still exists, but this is in like on International Drive in Orlando, Florida, right. Right? Yep. where it's all hotels and NASCAR cafe and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And we go in there and they have artists, you know, who are just sitting there making stuff. There was one guy, his name was the Eggman, and he just had all these wooden eggs and he would just paint like faces and people on them. And, you know, he had his little like placard up. And so it was kind of like an artist pop up and they had a rotation of artists. And then the people who eat there get to go up and kind of, you know, you know, chew the fat with the artists. And I'm sure they get a big kick out of it. And it's kind of this fun, friendly environment and everything and um uh, and then the someone comes the he gets the manager to come to our table and he's like you need to talk to him he's an artist he just graduated from art school he doesn't have a job he needs to make money if he's going to be with my sister and he needs to you know maybe you should talk to him so i ended up like kind of out of pressure, not that I really wanted to do it, but I, I did it. So I spent a couple of days there where I would just kind of set up and I would paint and make these things. And then they put it up on the wall uh -huh. and people would sell it. They would sell it and people would buy it. And, um, you know, it was an interesting experience. And, you know, that was the first time I had sold a painting. And my first painting went to the comedian Carrot Top. So apparently what? he's like a big yeah. patron of, you know, they were like, oh, yeah, he loves it here. He comes in here all the time. He buys art all the time. And he saw my, you know, kind of stereotypical late 90s street art inspired pen and ink drips, you know, my stuff. And he was like, oh, I want that and, and everything. Um, so uh, that was my first kind of commercial fine art experience. And it was an interesting one. And it was a nice one. I'll be honest, I think it's a good story. But uh, so then we moved up to Washington, DC. And again, this was kind of a temporary thing. And I had interviewed at a startup company. And um, I got the job there as their graphic designer. And, um, you know, I walked into my interview that it was very intimidating. Um, I was not proficient at digital, you know, desktop publishing. My Photoshop skills are very limited. I didn't know anything about Quark. Definitely didn't know anything about HTML, JavaScript. Um, Flash was starting to come around and everything like that. So they hired me. And, it, you know, and I remember when they hired me and they called me and they gave me the offer, I was kind of like, are you sure? Because I don't know how to use a computer. I don't even have email. You know, I had email to apply to these jobs. I had, that was my first email. Um, and they were like, yeah, yeah, yeah. They were like, you know, anybody can learn to use a computer. Like we just want someone that, you know, we think will have uh, the, you know, the creativity right. to do what we want. So I got a job there and I kind of became a, um, a one-stop uh, stock art factory. And the, the product that we were doing was almost like a uh, Evite type uh, situation before Evite. So people would be able to kind of post an invitation and they could pick a theme and so it was my job to go through this list of themes that the content makers and, and the, they would be, so I just kind of like what we did with the owl. So I had to kind of check off things, you know? So I just remember being like having to figure out how to pull off all these different illustration styles that were reflective of whatever that theme was. I think there was a donut themed party 
And at that time, Dunkin' Donuts had a very specific visual language in their brand. Uh -huh. It was very uh, kind of juvenile and like, you know, a coffee mug with little swirls yeah. to show the smoke and, you know, using their, their corporate color palette. And that was a circumstance where, you know, I kind of learned, I was really good at mimicking these styles. Like I would kind of make it my own, but, you know, I, I got really good at that. And, um, you know, and that progressed. And then as I got more into art direction and graphic design and as my responsibilities kind of grew and I was becoming, you know, I was programming, I was designing interfaces, I was designing logos and branding. And, you know, it was my second education. And I was working under art directors who were incredible and, you know, years of experience. And they were willing to teach me print design or the, the programmers would teach me just enough code to make me dangerous so that I could then start designing for those things. And that's what always drove it, right? So if I saw a style, it wasn't so much about like, oh, I want to take that style and make it mine and, you know, capitalize by knocking off this person. It was more of a personal kind of like, I just want to have this in my arsenal. I just right. want to learn how to do this. Whether or not anyone ever sees it again makes no difference to me. You know, I'm not doing this to like show, but it turned it. It helped my career in that regard because, you know, as a graphic designer and art director, there were a lot of situations, especially when I was at an agency, where all of a sudden it was like, well, we don't need to hire an illustrator. We got Matt. And they're like, yeah, but we want this style. And they were like, no, he can do that. And, you know, um, and, you know, I, I got to the point where I was like, OK, I, I can make this my own in that I can use the things that I'm inherently, I think, you know, kind of good at, which is composition and negative space, all that, you know, kind of having the eye to pull it off. Um, and I would parlay that in, in that, you know, I was able to kind of, if I wanted, if I was in art direction on a, uh, if I was art directing a campaign, you know, there would be maybe an illustration style that I thought would fit perfectly with that, you know? And I would be like, well, you know, maybe if it's a combination, it's almost like, well, what if Evan Hecox did, you know, a mix of Evan Hecox and like, you know, some heavy collage of Claus Vorman who did like, you know, the Beatles revolver uh, album cover and stuff. And it's like, you know, these weird kind of like you got your chocolate and my peanut butter and vice versa. So it was always like a love of graphic art in all its forms that really informed how, you know, I was I'm a fan. So I would go in there and and, you know, I I would try and almost create, you know, uh, an art, an illustrator that didn't exist. And he only existed for this project. And he did this weird kind of marriage of whatever it was that we ended up doing. And um, so that, <clears throat> that to me was how I really got excited about my career. And that it wasn't about like, well, I want to be an illustrator so that as soon as someone sees my illustration, like a shepherd fairy or something, people can recognize it. Right. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think I would be, um, I, I don't think I would be that happy if I was someone who was only doing this one thing, you know, I don't think that like I would have been very happy personally. And um, so I always just kind of rolled with, learning more and more and you know when you do it that way um you know you, you get to work on a lot of cool stuff and you get to learn a lot and you get to meet a lot of cool people so that's kind of how i how how my career went from doodling to you know art direction illustration graphic art etc yeah cool Let's go. Do you want to jump in? 
I was just going to ask, you know, I, we both, you know, majored in illustration and I was going to ask how you, how you really learned the graphic design side of it. Um, and it, is it, is it from, you know, the kind of making your own assignments, creating these hybrids or working with these talented art directors? Um, Cause we didn't, we didn't go to school for graphic design yet. Here right. we are both designers, both creative directors, art directors. Um, yeah. And I know which which is the case sense. for a lot of, our old classmates, right? So I, I think yeah. also at that time, uh, not to cut you off, sorry, but no, no, no. you know, I, I mean, I remember when I would meet up with old RISD heads and stuff who I graduated, you know, we all left RISD at the same time and, you know, printmaking, apparel, industrial design, painting. Yeah, we're all web designers. Yeah, yeah. You know, <laughs> and and I think that was a big part of it. But, you know, even before that, when I was at school, you know, at RISD, I was really into, um, I was really into graphic design. And that was another thing. It was one of those things where it was like, I had always really been into graphic design without really ever knowing I was into graphic design. Um, so, I mean, when I look back on my, you know, core memories of things that stand out to me, you know, as a little kid, I think of logos on like you know the tomi logo from tomi toys um certain aesthetic things that you know i didn't know at the time i wasn't sophisticated to kind of articulate like oh i was really into that because you know it's a really nice design and and it do did its job and it worked on me and so even when i was in art school too i had um I had gotten pulled into doing like skateboard graphics for a small skateboard company. And at that time, you know, mid nineties skateboard graphics were really cool. And yeah. there were a lot of really talented designers and artists making graphics for these companies. And also their, their advertising was getting more sophisticated and we were seeing like really evolved branding whereas before thrasher etc you know it was more punk um you know in the 80s and in in and early 90s there was still that punk component and that surfer component and which is all amazing but then in the 90s there was this overlay of kind of like a more tech oriented kind of look and feel whether it was like even in the in the sneaker designs um, but in the print ads, uh, the motion graphics in the videos and things like that. And also, you know, electronic music, DJing, you'd get all the imports from the UK. You know, uh, I was a huge fan of Warp Records, you know, with Square Pusher and Aphex Twin. And they had the Designers Republic doing a majority of their graphic design. And when I came, like a lot of people in that era, when you come across the the designers republic you're just kind of floored you know it's almost we didn't have the saturation of japanese graphic art culture in the us um at that time the way that we have it now um and so it was it was being exposed to all sorts of different kinds of graphic visual language that really got me inspired and i was kind of like wow this is really cool that this combination of design and kind of cartooning and graphic art and how it all like blends together. And, you know, that just fascinated me. And it was something where I was like, I, I got to figure out how to make this stuff. I, I got to figure out how to do that. So I would go to the computer lab with my friends in the illustration building and I would sit there and I didn't know anything about type tools or fonts really. I mean, I had a general, you know, kind of knowledge. So I kind of faked it and, you know, I got lucky on a couple things that I was doing where I was setting some type, but, you know, I mean, looking back on it now, I didn't know anything, but, you know, it was, it was being, I was just motivated. I was motivated to learn that stuff. And then when I got that job and I was surrounded by really smart people who, who knew computers and you know, were more than happy to kind of show me. They're like, oh, dude, you know, all you like, they showed me how to scan my line drawings, bring them into Photoshop, separating them. You know, 
and it's until you make that breakthrough that you you know before that everything i did in photoshop was just like i would use the paint bucket tool if i needed a blue background if it was a drawing of a hand i would just click the paint bucket into all the open spaces to fill it up, not <laughs> knowing that, you know, you could separate everything and have different layers. Um, That's cool. Well, yeah. so let's look at some art. Sure. Um, hopefully that's coming through the proper color. I'm seeing a little. Yeah. So um, do you want me to tell you about this or? Absolutely. We'll that's go through right. a few of your pieces. Sure. So this is actually right down the, the background there. Um, this is a still from a video. Um, it was a profile on me um, by uh, the company that commissioned me to create some artwork for, for a, uh, a project that they had. And they hired a local film crew here in D.C. named Run Riot Films, um, Chris Tuss, Dave Adams, uh, and um, uh, Josie uh Swatek, I want to say her last name is anyway a uh, super talented group of people they came and followed me around for a couple days and you know interviewed me and everything and this was in in Mount Pleasant where up until about two years ago that's where my studio was so this is right down the street from my studio and um they kind of hit me up and they were like hey Matt you know it would be really neat if you, if like you could maybe almost like do a rotoscope of the background so that when you know we end on this shot we can kind of mask it out and then have this you know this Matt Curry version of Mount Pleasant behind you. And so that's where this came from. And so that was this is you know right on Mount Pleasant Avenue and or right on Mount Pleasant Street and um you know, I'm literally standing in the middle of the road. There were little kids like skateboarding at the little park to the uh, to the left of me there. And um, so, yeah, so this kind of gives you a good example of that. You know, this is kind of the core illustration style, I would say, that I personally like um, of, of when I'm doing my own stuff is this kind of gestural loose uh playing with line weights kind of keeping it a little abstract but fluid and um and giving it some texture yeah um, so yes so that's where tell this me, uh what's that graphic on the bottom of the deck of the, the skateboard so that is a that was that's a an owl that's an Victorian owl it's an early version no i'm just kidding <laughs> yeah it does look like one it, it is look. kind of owly it's kind of like this Grim Reaper cyborg-y thing. And that was done for a, a skateboard company out of the UK. Um, and, you know, they were like, you know, I had never skated on that board. It had been a minute since I skated. And they were like, hey, why don't you push around and stuff? And I was like, I don't know, man. I, it's been a while. And, you know, I don't. So uh, I, I was pushing around on that board and I had it. And that was a board my wife got me for my birthday because, uh, you know, she was like, you know, I know you you, you want to skate and you haven't. So I got you like one of you. I, she bought one of my decks that I designed and got it set up and everything, oh, really cool. and, you know. And so they were like, just push around on it. And so I did. And um, yeah, so that's where that's from. And that, I think that was the last time I rode that board. <laughs> I actually have a question. You know, you have this uh, ongoing theme of these amazing, like, dragon scales. You know, your boy mm -hmm. versus dragon is your kind of art name and this yeah. amazing kind of visual aesthetic that you've established. Where did that, when did that come about in your in your art career? And what is it about them that you love? Is it, um, is it you know, I don't want to fill in the blanks, but what what made you do the dragon scales? Um, they're amazing. I'm just curious where they come from. Thanks, man. Um, you know, it, funny enough, it, when I was really little in like third and fourth grade, myself and, and a buddy of mine, we used to really draw these elaborate, uh, I would say, dungeons and dragons kinds of uh, landscapes. And, um, you know, this is when we had read The Hobbit for the first time or saw the Bakshi animation movie of it. And um, 
So I would draw these dragons and I got really into the, the scales. I always loved that. And then later in life, um, you know, I was, I was working on a friend of mine who was doing a documentary film and he was, he was working on something that had to do. I, I, I can't remember the artist's name. Um, he's very well known, but he essentially takes kind of like, you know, um, 18th century Japanese or even like Hokusai style things and then paints these very modern things in that tone and he's a japanese american artist he his studios in hawaii and um you know i was looking at that and i he wasn't doing anything with scales or dragons or anything but i i started playing around with some compositions and you know I had drawn this very loose uh, kind of, you know, serpentine dragon, you know, the kind that is kind of like the snake with the dog face and, you know, claws and et cetera. And I drew the scales and they were very kind of clumsy. There was, you know, they weren't clean. They all had like different weights to it in the line. And there was something about that that I really liked. And I couldn't put my finger on it and I didn't know it at the time, but I was really interested in that. And in a weird way, it kind of became almost like a homework assignment that I gave myself where I was like, huh, well, this is something that's kind of, you know, it encompasses a lot of the things that I like in terms of drawing and, and speaks to my history, you know, coming from like, you know, almost like a science fiction fantasy background when I was a kid, um, drawing dragons and comics. You know, I think of like the Captain America Aquaman chain mail and how they would kind of use that texture. And I liked this idea of kind of being like, all right, well, let's see what you can do with this. And I just started working with, with that. And again, it wasn't really anything other than, you know, Oh, let's, I like this. I want to keep, I like that texture. I like how that looks. And I really like it when I do this with it and so on and so forth. And then over time, it kind of gelled into, in a weird way, like the more abstract my work got, these things, the scale formations kind of served as like a glue to like pull these things together so that you know, there's almost always some kind of organic quality to it. And, and, you know, a lot of it too is kind of based, I like the idea of like this mythology. And, and again, this, this has nothing, whether or not people get this from the work, it makes no difference. But in my own internal movie dialogue, right, you know, to me, it's kind of like, well, I like this idea of like the evolution of something like a dragon, right? It comes from history. And when people were like, what is that? Oh, that's a dragon. But chances are it was, you know, a Komodo dragon or a lizard or a snake or, uh, yeah. you know what I mean? Or a man in the water. That this idea that, you know, monsters being made from the real world right and so i was kind of like well you know maybe if if this is interesting enough for me that i like this idea that it's kind of like if you look at the totality of it you see the evolution of it and it kind of reflects almost like the myth of this dragon you know um has evolved over time and it's become less of a dragon in more of this just, you know, maelstrom of kind of visual activity. And it's in a weird way, it, it works, you know, as a, uh, I can strip it down and keep it real graphic, or I can be very detailed with it and convey you know, a little bit more of a, 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 voluminous, a voluminous kind of 
creature or thing. And, you know, that that's kind of where it comes from. And that's why it stays there. It's become a little bit of a, almost like a visual tick of mine. So yeah. that I can kind of use that as a means to make sense of things. And I know that when I look at certain stuff that I'm doing, you know, I'm pretty confident. I'm like, well, I'm looking at this with these eyes that I, you know, I, I ask myself, I'm like, I wonder how other people, you know, see this. Like to me, I can see the inner workings and all the stuff that goes behind it. But I know that I can only see that because it's, you know, right. It's, it's my crazy. Well, let's, uh, let's, you know, here's an example of the scales. This is a, a piece you did for the Niftorian project. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it's interesting because you mentioned earlier about negative space. There's a lot of that going on here, but we can see the, we can see like the dragon look in this and then it sort of morphs into an owl and then you've got some other things going on. Mm -hmm. I'm not really sure what these people are doing here or if those even are people, but they look like the, the little wooden people dolls. Yeah. The, like the floaters. Yeah. Kind of like the floating ghosts or phantoms or something. And again, it's, it's a lot of this stuff is just kind of like iconography that, that, in a weird way, like I, I've, I, I think it's almost like you know, this is my typeset. This is this is my you know this is my vocab. The, the, these are my fonts, and so I'm able to kind of create tone and composition using these elements. And for me, they all have like a different kind of physicality to them. So if I have the, the scales that are going from top to bottom and are kind of going like, you know, downward, like to me, you know, even though it's a static image, I want it to have this sense of like, it's being pulled down, like there's going to be some gravity involved. And the, the juxtaposition of kind of like the two guys that are flo floating up from that. And, um, and I used to animate this stuff all the time back in the old, uh, the flash macromedia flash days where, you know, I would animate, you know, the entire browser would be something like this that would have some kind of component of animation. And those little character ghost guys would float up from the bottom. You know, you do stuff where it's like it become your cursor and you can drag them around that kind of right. thing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so this is really cool. I mean, we really, really like this piece. And it is interesting because you talked about this idea that you accumulated all these different skills, a toolkit, but not really your style. But then like what I see time and time again is this style emerge. Um, and and I, I'm sure that depends on the type of work you're doing. Um, and I think what we'll do is because um, we don't have that much more time, uh, but I thought what would be sort of, good we could what we might do is maybe we'll come back um we'll get back together and we'll talk just about what we did with niftorian just do like a 20 minute piece yeah i think people would be cool uh looking yeah, at sorry i i talked too long no you didn't I, listen this is the point the point is we want to hear what you're doing but i did want to show just a couple other pieces of mm -hmm. your work so people can get a sense that there's there's a lot of stuff here and i think we don't we haven't even fully captured the breadth of what you're working on but i what is this project um, so we were asked, myself and uh, Neil Ashby, who uh, is a partner, uh, he and I do a lot of art direction and design together. Um, he's an incredible graphic designer. Um, you know, he designed uh, so many things out in the world that we all know. And um, it's really interesting. But anyway, um, an, an old colleague of his is a, um, I, th I think he's an art director at Pokemon America. And in Japan, they do a lot of really cool, uh, you know, Pokemon merchandise. And, you know, their program over there is, is, is pretty, you know, um, pretty diverse. And they, they really kind of push the envelope. I mean, we all know, you know, Japanese packaging is incredible. Um, so they, you know, and the American market is getting there. But, you know, they they hadn't, you know, there's still some hesitation, I believe, in doing that. So anyway, 
they he asked us to put together some materials for them to start thinking about the future in terms of like, well, what could we do over here that is in the same kind of vein as like what they're doing in, in Japan. Um, and so this was right around, they were already in the midst of their 25th anniversary, which is taking place. I think it was last year was the official 25th anniversary. Mm -hmm. And um, so they, they hit us up to um, create some work for them and some concepts and some ideas. And so we did a, a number of a number of things. And so my job, you know, I kind of went in and, and, you know, we wanted to narrow the focus. We're like, OK, well, for this example, let's let's run with obviously Pikachu. He's their Mickey Mouse. He's the most recognizable. Um, and plus, from a character design standpoint, it's brilliant, you know, an amazing design. Um, so for for these pieces here, these are just some like skateboard deck ideas that I came up with. You know, we did some type treatment, like truncating Pokemon and kind of, you know, doing this like Pokemon, you know, yep. um, with like there's a bunch of other stuff we did. I mean, we went crazy kind of showing how you could do different uh, type systems within this stuff and and everything like that. So. So these were all put back on them and they had us like present it to their team and everything like that. So um, chances are in the, in the future, we'll probably be doing something. I mean, they, they plan things out so far in advance. Right. I mean, I think when we were talking, they were already, they had like the next two years already like slotted and stuff. Um, so that was a fun opportunity. And my son was really excited when i was working on that i can uh, imagine and, yeah you know well let's talk about something we'll close on this idea we started out with the idea that you grammy nomination we'll close on something that scojo is excited about is some of the work that you've done in the music industry yeah so, so tell us what we're seeing here so this is for dust galaxy which was released on esl music that's 18th street lounge music uh a lot of people in dc will know that um and that's the record label of Thievery Corporation, um, which is a pretty big international down tempo. You know, if you've seen Garden State and you have their soundtrack, you probably know Thievery Corporation, right? Um, so this is uh, was the first record from Rob Garza, who is one of the two. Even though Thievery Corporation is a, they have a whole band and a lot of people involved. It's Eric Hilton and Rob Garza are kind of like the duo, you know, of of the production team, right? And they're kind of the face of the band. So this was his first um, solo project that they did, and um, so for this we did. A whole bunch of different art direction, uh, a lot of different concepts. Usually, real quick, when we do album covers, um, we'll probably do. We'll Neil and I will do dozens. Like, you know, by the time we we get to the the selection or the concept, he and I will have put together like sixty different uh, album covers. Yeah. yeah, and this kind of originally started as like we kind of wanted to go with a little bit of a ins inspiration from like black light posters, um, you know, and also I wanted to do this like Frank Frazetta meets, you know, almost like video game arcade console artwork. Oh yeah. And uh, you know, he didn't really go for that, but the visual language that we did, which has this kind of glowing, you know, or a, you know, weird kind of color uh, with texture and, and energy. And so all of that came back full circle. And I can't remember where the snakes came from, but we, again, it was just something where we kind of put this thing together. It told the story that we wanted it to tell at the time. This is a pretty old record. So I, I you'll forgive me. I, I can't remember too much about the 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 concept of that one but yeah that was one of of many different records that we did for uh for esl 
Well, this uh, like the it's you know it's sort of interesting because the the font in here yeah reminds me very much of like Summer of Love, Age of Aquarius, sort of late sixties, early seventies, and yet you you mentioned black light and it 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 dawned on me that's the image reminds me of a black light poster from the mid eighties. Yeah, uh, it's a really interesting juxtaposition of the two because obviously those were those the time period of those was very close. They're heavily influenced by each other. Black black lights. I mean, black light posters were like the next logical evolution beyond the lava lamp. Absolutely. Uh, and so, yeah. uh, so I, I I just think it's a really cool thing, and I was I'm glad you're able to tell us the story behind it. No problem. Um, yeah. And I had one other one here too. Yep. Um. um so this is uh. Oh, this yeah, this is interesting. Um. So, um. Uh, a friend of mine named Dustin Hostetler used to run a art zine called Fasthetic Magazine, and um, it was it was pretty big. It had like a lot of really amazing artists in it, and it was all black and white. Anyway, he went on to work for uh, the T-shirt company. I don't know if you guys know called Threadless, um, and. When he was on there, he got brought on in a curatorial capacity to kind of bring in some artists, you know, to do these one-off things because everything and uh, Threadless was kind of not crowdsourced, but you could put up a design, people would vote on it. If it, you know, got enough, then they would make it. Mm -hmm. And um, so they did a select line and they brought myself and a few other really talented people in there. And so if you look at this character um, in that center area where you can kind of see his lungs and like the yeah. spinal column and that kind of stuff. So the T-shirt I designed, I was thinking of doing like the old rib cage skeleton T-shirts, right? Where it's like the right. black shirt yeah. with the white bones on it. Yeah. But I wanted it obviously to be a little bit more my speed. And so I designed this more like abstract kind of reference to those things and there's a heart on there and there's you know you can see the rib cage and all that stuff and then uh to make it a little bit more special for the the select line um they had asked me what else we could do and i had said like well what if we did a poster um or maybe dustin said how do you feel about doing a poster and so this poster came with the t-shirt right oh nice and then so flash forward you know, five or six years, I get contacted from uh, by Ernesto Gomez at Sony Music. He's an art director. And uh, one of the band members for this band called Three Days Grace. Um, I wasn't aware of them, um, you know, but, you know, it's rock, metal, kind of grungy, uh, uh, you know, and they saw this and got excited by it. So they hit me up and they were like, what's the story with this and blah, blah, blah. And I owned all the artwork and I talked to Dustin. I was like, Hey, you know, and he was like, no, you're fine. Anyway. So, uh, I talked to them and of course me, I'm like, well, wow, that's great. That's wonderful. I'm like, but can't we do something different? I'm like, I think that's great. You guys want to work with me. Can we do something different and everything? And they were like, no, this is it. This is what we want. And, um, so, they ended up buying the rights on the artwork and I worked with Sony music and helped lay out some of the stuff. And, um, and so it became an album cover. It went on tons of merchandise. I've seen people. Um, I did like a Google search on this when, over at my, uh, at my buddy Neil's studio. We were looking at it. People have gotten tattoos of it and fan art, which I've never seen anyone do fan art of my, of my work before. So that was really cool to see. So, you know, it got parlayed and got turned into some music packaging and I, they animated stuff, did like a music video for it and everything too. So it was pretty cool. Yeah. I can see, I just pulled it out. I just did a quick Google search image search. You can see some of it. That's uh, that is really cool. Uh, I'm glad we, we asked that question about it. So this overlap with the uh, music industry is really, is really kind of fascinating. Um, so it's a dream come true for me, right? If I had gone back in time and told like 18-year-old me, hey, you're going to be making album covers, I'd be like, what? You're crazy. 
<laughs> All right. So we are at the, at our limit here for time. Let's go. Do you have any parting thoughts here? Uh, I would just say, thank you. It's been amazing to work with you. Um, Likewise. the pass you did is amazing. And the many, many, many owls with the hundreds and hundreds of attributes are just another world. I'm so excited to launch it. And uh, that was a lot of fun. World. Yeah. It was great to work with you and, and really fun. So thank you. Thank for you. Being all right, cool. Well, we'll uh, we'll we'll grab twenty minutes just to talk about that project. But I'm glad this Let's was a better setup because now we know the story behind the story. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, Matthew Curry, thank you so much for joining us today. How can uh, how can people find out more about your art? Um, you know, you can follow me on Instagram at boy versus dragon. That's B O Y V S dragon. Perfect. And um, that's where I will be posting anything worth posting. All right, everybody. Until next week, happy hunting. Thanks a lot for coming out today. And thank you, Matthew Curry. This was awesome. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you, guys. I appreciate it. Take care.